You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. This evening, I am going to be answering a number of listener questions. I've had... uh, I get a lot of these questions all the time and these ones have been stocking up and the ones that I've come back to a couple of times and looked at and thought, I need to answer those. So tonight I think I've got three or four different questions I'm going to and each of them I hope will resonate with you in a different way. So you can check those out and have a listen. If you are new to the podcast, please go to anxietypodcast.com where you can download the free toolkit to end anxiety forever, uh, the five-week course, which I still get great feedback about. There's all those sorts of things there for you to kind of get stuck into. Also, if you want to become a sponsor or a supporter or a member, I think it's called membership under anxietypodcast.com, if you click on the membership tab, you can uh, become a Patreon and contribute to the show each week. I have some amazing Patreons currently, and uh, yeah, I love it. And uh, I love you. Thank you so much for contributing. It makes a big difference um, and helps me pay running costs towards hosting and stuff to, to keep the show going. So thanks for that. Um, also, uh, also other exciting things to talk about in about 10 days, nine days on June 30th, I am starting the first ever More Life Mastermind, which is an eight week experience. It runs every Sunday. It's a live conversation on the phone with me or on video chat with me and uh, a group of other people who are looking to change their lives uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, geographically, I don't know, all of those things. Um, And yeah, you should get involved. If it's something you've been thinking about, then uh, you should definitely check that out. If you're on the website, just click on the Mastermind tab, and you will be able to see all of the details there. A few spots left, probably two spots left, realistically, based on how many we've got so far, because I want to keep it a small and sort of more intimate group so everybody gets a chance to contribute and talk and and uh yeah help them hold them accountable to make the changes in their life that they want to make essentially so anyway there you have it all right so on to some questions for this week um <clears throat> i'm going to read them out as i often do and then i will provide commentary i haven't done a lot of uh sort of note taking um, in advance of this. I've just read these questions a few times. And so I'm going to gonna just kind of go with what feels right in terms of the answers for these ones. So here's the first one. I'm not going to bother with names because it doesn't really matter. But if you wrote it, you know who you are. And thanks for sending it in. Started listening to your podcast a few months ago and it's completely changing my life. I finally feel like somebody gets it. I've suffered with anxiety and ultimately depression for the past decade. I'm now 27 years old and know that this is not my st- not how my story is going to end. I've tried everything in your podcast with something I came across by chance and as a last resort. So thank you. I'm slowly but surely getting better. One of my worst anxieties is traveling away from home. I want to recover from this at my own pace and as you say, not to be attached to the outcome. And I know this is something you cannot rush. So I was wondering if I could get your advice on something. I have plans to emigrate from Dublin to Vancouver in January with my girlfriend. If I had no anxiety, yes, this is absolutely something I would want to do. But at the moment, I struggle even going an hour away from home. I know that one day I will be recovered and be able to make such a move. But is it wise to set a date for Vancouver and go when it might be too much too soon? Or should I go regardless? I want to do this the right way and I feel like the pressure of moving to Canada is making me very attached to the outcome as I feel I need to be better in order to make this move. I hope this email reaches you well. Uh, I was trying to find an episode based on agoraphobia, agoraphobia, uh, but couldn't find one. So I hope you don't mind the email, kind regards, etc, etc. All right, well, first of all, Thank you for your brave email and thanks to everybody who writes to me, whether it's through Facebook or Instagram messages or emails to the website. Um, I love getting all your all your bits and pieces and a lot of it gives me inspiration about things to discuss on the show. So keep sending them in for sure. Listen, with regards to this one, um, I think it's a little bit of a, a chicken and egg scenario, right? So you, if you wait long enough to be ready, you'll never be ready. 
That's the first answer. And I've used the, the fantastic analogy before of if you are sitting in the driveway of your house, if if you didn't leave your house until all the lights were green on the route to your destination, you would never leave. And I think that's a a great illustration to answer this question, which is like for this um for this individual who's talking about moving, it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to feel completely right. It's never going to all align amazingly where you wake up and feel euphoric and your bags are all packed and the birds are singing outside and there's zero turbulence on the plane and everything's on time. That's just not how the how sort of life works for us. So there's going to be times where it feels difficult um, and it's going to be tough, you know, and I think you what you can do for yourself is prepare accordingly. So if Vancouver is in January and right now it is June, then can you do some smaller trips, right? Can you visit other places in advance that are, if you, at the moment you have an hour away capability, can you go from Dublin to Belfast or Dublin to London on a ferry or on a little flight somewhere and start to flex that muscle and test yourself a bit? Because, you know, traveling away from home is one thing, right? Traveling some distance and 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 that is one thing. It's another thing to move different countries because then you've got not only travel and distance and missing people, but the cultural impact and, you know, um, there's just not enough Guinness in Vancouver, quite frankly. Um, there probably is, but you know what I mean? Like, I think you need to work towards it. And, and, I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying my aspirational goal or what I'm working towards is going to Vancouver. Um, because I think it's fine to have, you know, things to, to work towards and you can work towards that by, again, doing shorter trips and sort of getting ready for it. If you feel like you're building confidence, if you feel like you're moving in the right direction, you're progressively getting better, but it still seems daunting. Well, that's probably just because it's always going to feel a little bit daunting and that's part of the process and that's something you probably need to grow and stretch through okay so for some people it might be you can't leave your house and one step outside is progress for some people it might be you've never been outside your country and you want to go outside your country and that's progress what i can tell you specific to your situation is that canada and like vancouver and dublin uh they're different but you know you, the language barrier isn't there. Um, weather isn't actually that dissimilar. We got lots of rain in Vancouver and lots of rain in Dublin. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. Um, there's, there's obviously no doubt a very large Irish contingent in Vancouver as well. So you could get some 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 home based stuff going on. But anyway, I'm rambling a bit now. But I think work towards it would be my answer. Start to go through the process. Start to extend yourself a little bit. Do some mini trips. Get used to it. Um, and 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 kind of work towards it. And then, you know, if, if Vancouver ends up not being the destination and you go somewhere else, look at all the skills you will have learned in the interim. That's what it's all about, right? If you don't get to the ultimate destination. Or another way to put it is it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And that's absolutely the truth for you as well. This is about your ability to grow in the interim, okay? All right, that is question number one. Question number two. Again, no names. No names are necessary here. <clears throat> Thank you for everything you offer to help fellow anxiety sufferers like myself. It can really uh, make a difference to someone's life. I'm sure you get hundreds of these emails, but I really do need a bit of help and guidance. I was diagnosed with severe anxiety four years ago. A year in, I was doing well. Not the best, but my life started coming back. I then started up a business, which followed me starting up another business, which I love, but I got addicted to working, which probably in turn took it out of me. I'm currently in a blip. All my symptoms have returned. My thoughts are extremely negative and I feel like there is no hope. It's soul destroying, as I'm sure you know. I seem to struggle to do anything at all with the anxiety symptoms being prominent. My problem has always been, uh, what do I do? Do I rest? Do I try and do things? If so, what do I try? Do I do as much as I can? No matter how I feel? I have so many questions going around. Uh, it's just adding to the confusion. I have spent like yourself, so much money on trying to get my usual self back together, and that just adds more pain to the cause. I know I'm not alone. My family are great. My girlfriend's great, but you can't help feeling like you are alone in this dark place. I've done so much research, which all suggests you should be friends with your anxiety. Let thoughts come and go and think as positive as you can, like your theory to lean in. But my problem is, how on earth do you do this? 
Anyway, I'm going to stop waffling on. I appreciate any reply that you may supply. It rhymes. Um, just reading this email again, because I read it earlier, but it feels like, and I don't know if anybody else listening gets this, but it feels like there's a lot of pressure to some, for something to happen here, which is pretty normal. And, and maybe on the basis of said you started a business and you started another business, you, you were an entrepreneurial minded individual, which got addicted to working and you're taking that same tenacity and aggressive nature and, and, uh, passion and trying to put it towards fixing yourself. And sometimes like, you know, horsepower doesn't get it done. Sometimes it's the opposite, right? Sometimes instead of trying, um, too hard as you said you know what do i do do i rest do i try things do i do as much as i can no matter how i feel it feels like there's a tremendous amount of pressure to just get over it and as i've talked about in the past and as we know if you're if you put a lot of pressure on into recovery then at some point when you get past a specific degree um it tends to become counterproductive because then you're pressurizing yourself to get better um, and too much pressure means that you, you know, the, the anxiety starts to thrive under pressure for whatever reason. So letting go of the need for speed, letting go of the need to have it happen in a certain time frame, I would say is, is important. But I also, the other thing that kind of comes to mind when I read a bit of your story is that I feel like you know, if we think about why anxiety shows up for people, I've spoken to hundreds of not, you know, yeah, hundreds, hundreds of people on the phone and in real life. And people often say, oh, I've no idea what's going on. I don't know why I'm anxious. And I'm like, well, all right, let's talk it through. And by the end, the time you get to the end of the story, the, in 99 times out of 100, there's a very good reason why you're anxious. There's a very, it's not a surprise. It's not a It's not like, oh my God, everything was fine. Then one day I just woke up like this. It happens because of our disalignment. It happens because there's something going on. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, these things tend to to bubble up to the surface. For sensitive people like me, like you, it bubbles up to the surface as anxiety and, and then something we have to ultimately face. So that's kind of where I would do a little bit of digging. And I and again, I'm reading a massive amount into a couple of paragraphs, but Somewhere in your story of of uh, striving and excellence and starting businesses and and all those sorts of things is potentially that workaholic, potentially that sort of manic natured beast, which I've certainly been myself in the past. Where it's like, look, I just got to get this done. I just got to get it finished. I need to get over anxiety so I can get on to the next thing. It's just a pain in the ass. It's in the way, right? Um, that's some of the emotion or some of the sentiment I get coming through here. So my recommendation is, is to slow down, is to focus on the little things, right? Um, not look for strategies to beat it, but look for ways to take care of yourself. Um, so more time outside, more walks, more meditation, more sort of slowing down and not trying to race to the finish line, but just trying to progressively move in the right direction because it's exasperating, right? If you say, well, everything's fine. I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, that line of thought doesn't cure anxiety. It doesn't help get you past it because you're effectively, whether you mean to or not, you're judging yourself and you are judging your ability to just get over it and move on, which isn't productive. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, all right, moving on to the next question. I have four actually. So this is number three. Came across your podcast recently. I've been binge listening to it since. They are refreshing, real life advice, and I love listening to and find uh, real life advice. I love listening to, and I find that I can actually use it. Thank you for what you're doing. My experience is long and complicated, over 19 years, and it wasn't until September, when at age 44, I started working with the therapist, that I have made some excellent progress towards recovering. I've also made some important lifestyle changes, meditating, reading, giving up coffee, journaling, exposures, etc. I've gone from avoiding social and work meetings to now doing them and actually enjoying them. One issue I am left with is, and that I find frustrating and confusing is sweating. I find whenever I'm presenting or on the spot in a work or social meeting and I'm asked a question, I sweat around my forehead. It's not always... Uh, it's not always, which makes it more frustrating. I breathe, I try to embrace it and sit through it. I do the same type of meetings over and over again, leaning in, but I can't stop it. 
I tell myself I don't care if people notice, but that's a tough one to truly believe. I tell myself, if this is the worst of it, it's not that bad, but that's also a tough one to accept. I continue to work with the therapist and take sage tablets as they are supposed to help, um, but I'm still dealing with it. I also use mindfulness techniques, but when you're in the thick of the moment, that becomes really difficult. I know the more I worry about it, the more I'm fueling it. Any advice? So this is something I've suffered with myself, so it's kind of close to my heart to some extent. And I'm not sure I'm going to have like a wrapped up in a little present with a bow on top answer for you here, because I don't know if I have it. But I will say that for sure, like, you know, sweating whilst presenting or sweating whilst talking is one of those things which is very strange. And pre having sort of bigger anxiety attacks, I definitely would get up to talk. And uh, when I get up there, I'd have a little bit of sweat on my forehead. Now, physiologically, I think that's natural. You can have a slightly elevated heart rate. You're preparing. If you've got a minor bit of fight or flight, um, then sweat is is normal because it's preparing you for battle. You're going to have to do something, right? So it's your system sort of gearing you up for action. But I would find back in the day um, that I would have a few beads of sweat on my forehead. And then as I got into my presentation, I got comfortable. They would just stop. They would just go away. I'd all of a sudden realize, like, oh, I'm not sweating anymore. That was weird. I'm not sure why that happened. And then when the anxiety was bad, I'd find that those beads of sweat would get me to focus on them. And I'd, then I'd notice that my whole hairline was kind of wet and my shirt was getting wet and I didn't want to take my jacket off because otherwise I'd have a big sweat patch on my shirt and, you know, what it's like, armpits and all that stuff. Um, so... Totally get it. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of what you've done is, is the right thing to do, which is, you know, continue to put yourself in that place, continue to to um, work through it, if you will. Um, for me, like a, a few things I did do, and I, again, like I'm just, just giving you kind of my own experience here, but from a clothing point of view, I don't know what you wear, um, but I definitely, and if it's a formal environment, then clearly more difficult if you have to wear shirts. But um, I did always make sure I wore sort of lighter clothing. I have like um, Lululemon style t-shirts, which are sort of that, I think it's called microfiber or whatever, that breathable type material. So I found that having things which weren't tight around my neck or just comfortable in the body were very useful to have. Um, another thing which I would avoid doing, and I'm, I'm guessing you probably do as well, is avoid having hot drinks before you're about to talk, because obviously if your temperature, your physical temperature is already high, then it's easier to start sweating. Um, so conversely, the other thing I would do is I would have a drink of water with ice cubes in it, um, because then I could make my face cold, right? So I, I would have a drink a water with ice cubes in it and maybe suck on an ice cube before you're going up to talk or when you get ready to talk or just having that very cold drink in front of you so that you can sip on that nice cold drink when you're um, about to talk or while you are talking or, you know, have an iced iced tea or whatever you want or just, yeah, again, water with ice in it. Um, that's what I would do. And that would keep my sort of, you know, s sweat in its appropriate response is to cool us, right? We start sweating when we're hot because it's supposed to cool our bodies down. So if you're already saying to your system, listen, mate, I got this, I'm cooling myself down with ice, then maybe your body won't feel like the need to create the sweat as much, right? So I think a combination of those things, those are, again, just coming in from experience. Um, <clears throat> and this is a bit of a weird one, but um I also used to find that for a long time that chamomile tea was kind of like my secret weapon. Now, whether it was a placebo, or whether it actually did anything, I couldn't answer that. But every time I went on stage, I would have chamomile tea and I would put ice in my chamomile tea. So I would go to Starbucks and say, right, chamomile tea, yeah, steep it for a minute right now. Dump that hot water out, <laughs> not dump the hot water out. Take the tea bags out and just please keep filling up with ice until it's really cold. Um... And then I would have iced chamomile tea. So I felt, I felt like that was like a secret weapon of calming the calmingness of uh, chamomile with the ice to kind of keep my head and, and body cold and, and feeling good. So that's it. I don't know if that's revolutionary, revolutionary or otherwise for you or whether you're like, yeah, Tim, that doesn't really help. But that's what I've got. Um, those would be the things. And I don't, you know, now I think it's one of those things where I think, right, if I feel hot and I'm sweating a little bit, if I just hang out in that place for a little bit longer and take care of, you know, the way I'm feeling, then, um, 
yeah, those are the sort of things that that um, put me in a good place. The other final thing is about public speaking, which I've uh, mentioned before, is that if you're going to stand up when you speak, then be standing up before you're going to speak. So what I mean is if you're going to stand on stage and talk, then I'll be standing up like way before I got to talk so I don't get lightheaded, I don't get sweaty, I've already been standing up and sipping on my ice water or whatever I've got, and uh, I'm basically ready to go. All right, which leads me on very well to my last and final question of the day. Um, This is somebody who said, uh, Hi Tim, sorry to bother you. You're not bothering me when you send me a message. Please don't write that. You're welcome to send me it. I want to email you. um, So anyway, they sent me an Instagram message. I'm hoping you can help me with the feelings of anxiety I experienced, or at least I think it's anxiety. Anxiety doesn't affect my daily life. Um, like I know it does for some people, but I find that when I'm in crowded spaces like festivals on busy train or at gigs, completely out of the blue, start to feel really uneasy and then leads to me feeling lightheaded and faint. I think the fainting element is maybe like a panic response. I usually just try and distance myself as best as I can to stop passing out until the feeling passes. I find it comes in waves. I don't know if I'm making a big deal out of nothing, but I can find now but I find now that I dread things when I know I'm going to be in a crowded place. I'm going to Glastonbury this year, which for those of you who don't know is a outdoor festival in England. It might even be this weekend. Uh, and I don't want uh, these feelings to stop me enjoying myself. Do you have any advice? I really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, very normal. First of all, you know, very normal. This, um, you know, and for sure, like feeling faint and, uh, feeling faint and dizzy a little bit for me in the past it's been like vertigo type feelings when I've been in crowded places or maybe in places where I feel like I can't get out or around specific people who um make me feel off um yeah I think it's uh it certainly is likely a, a panic type feeling I mean so think about it this from this point of view if you think about it from like a primal response if you're around you know that you go back to like the theory of the fact that we were only we can only really know a hundred people particularly well in our lives because of our old tribes and villages and stuff so if you're around thousands of people at a festival then maybe it's just that primal signal kicking in saying right this is danger because there's so many people here we don't know this is dangerous um you know same at concert and then you got you know stimulation of other things like music and loud noises on a train i'm pretty sure it's again movement uh, also potentially because you can't get off if you want to um so all those things f- for sure it's very common for them to contribute there may be other things going on for you which is that your breathing is increased and you're unaware of it um sometimes increasing your breathing is going to um increase your heart rate uh, which can make you feel lightheaded if you go from sitting down to standing up very quickly also can make you feel lightheaded so make sure you're hydrated um and and make sure you're sort of taking care of yourself from a from a food and drinks point of view because also if you're very hungry you haven't eaten for a long time that can make you feel lightheaded um so there's lots of different reasons why it can come up but here's my here's my solution to it find something to lean on or sit down Step number one, right? So you don't pass out. Nobody wants that to happen. So for me, if I feel lightheaded and dizzy, which I sometimes feel when I'm working out, I'll lean against the wall or I'll just sit down on the floor. Then I know I'm going to be fine. So that's the first couple of things you can do. Um, Sit down or lean against something and then just hang out in the space and focus on the feeling itself. When it comes, when you feel faint or dizzy, just think, oh, this is a time-sensitive event. In about 30 seconds, my body's going to reorientate itself and I'm not going to feel like this anymore so it's just a a time sensitive thing which is going to sort of wash over you and then dissipate again so if you really when it shows up really pay attention to it and really sort of lean into it and and follow it through the process it's going to be much less scary than when it shows up and be like oh my god maybe something sinister is happening no it's not it's just you're just lightheaded right triggered by a slight fear or triggered by that that sort of uh you know, feeling of being in a in a crowded place. So anyway, there's a couple of things for you to try out. I hope you have a nice time at a concert. I know we've had a lot of people who listen to the show who have gone through something or other and uh, decided that they're going to stick it out and they've ended up having a great time. 
There you have it. Thank you so much for listening this uh, week to this episode. If you have enjoyed listening to the Anxiety Podcast, please go to wherever you consume this and leave a review. I would massively appreciate it. If you have any questions, then send them through and I'll get to them on a future episode. If you want to join me on the amazing More Life Mastermind, go to the website and check out the dates and details for that. I would love to have you on board and super excited to get that kicked off. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.